um, it's time for our uh, audience to uh, put any last questions to our speakers and for our speakers also uh, to uh, comment uh, to each other. But uh, to begin the, the final round table, um, I've invited Michael Cronin himself to reflect back uh, on the, uh, the conference and on uh, the papers of uh, his fellow speakers. And so perhaps I can uh, invite Michael, yes, Michael, uh, to rejoin us uh, uh, and uh, to begin the, the, uh, the round table, Michael. Uh, thank you very much, um, Duncan. Um, I, 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 over the last two days, uh, I've been uh, reminded uh, of a story that I was told uh, when I was a young boy and I went to see uh, relatives of mine in the west of Ireland. And they, uh, one of them was, was talking about an experience that they, they, they had of, it was, uh, they were involved in an accident um, and they, they, they uh, were, were had a kind of a, a near-death experience and they talked about how they felt at that moment and this is quite a common feature um that they they, they kind of felt as the rising out of their their body uh and looking <laughs> down below uh, on this so I, I felt to some extent you know that uh, over the last two days there's been something of this kind of out of body experience uh for me listening to um such wonderful uh scholars and 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 and, and, and friends uh, talking about and, and, and reacting to the, to the work in, in, in all kinds of uh, different ways. It, 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 it really has been um, quite uh, an extraordinary experience. I, I really would like to, 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 to thank uh, everybody for, 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 for taking part in the, um, in, in, in the conference. Um, I, I also loved um, the fact that um, Susan has coined um, a new word, a Zoomer, which is the the absence of humor um, uh, because this is one of the things of course um, that I think if we were we were all together uh, and, and gathered um, that, that that humor would be one of those kind of lubricants um, that would keep our conversation uh, flowing in all its kind of reverence and uh, irreverence um, so I suppose um, just a, a, a couple of comments really in in in, in reaction to to um, various questions or issues that were, were, were brought up by, 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 by different um, speakers. Um, one of the things that kind of interested me in what Loredana was saying there about um, trace is the kind of notion that uh, Paul Verrillo, the French theorist, has that, you know, traditionally we, we've tended to think of, of people uh, in terms of, 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 of identity. It's a kind of classic thing of Dixon of Docks Green asks, you know, uh, where do you live? You know, where's your, 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 your physical place of of residence and so on. So it's, it's been that kind of notion uh, of, of, of fixity, stability, um, and, and this is the, you know, I, I constitutes your, your identity. Whereas um, what is kind of emerging, or what has emerged in, in, the, in late modernity is the notion of, of traceability. I mean, it's, it's all about tracking people's movements. Uh, you know, uh, if you like tracing where they are, finding the traces of, of, of who they are. So there's a sense in which that, that kind of notion of, of, of fluidity um, uh, is on, on the one hand, something that's emancipatory. Um, it, that, that, that sense of no longer having to subscribe to kind of a fixed uh, identities. There's the kind of metamorphic, transformative uh, qualities uh, of the of the fluid. Um, but I think one's also got to be aware of the the the, the, the slightly slightly darker uh, side to that, uh, which can be the, the the notion of of traceability, the kind of the, the cultures of surveillance that have become so much part um, of the contemporary world. And indeed, uh, translation is something that's very much uh, at the heart of that particular kind of uh, surveillance. Um, Industry. Um, one of the things in terms of of, of objects, I was very very glad that um, Lord uh, Dana brought up that the you know, the, the, the centrality, the role of of, of objects, which is described in the kind of the installation work of of Biamode. Um, and because this is seems to me something that um, is very much part uh, of the substantial move forward uh, in the ecological moment uh, is the kind of the reanimation of, of the world. And one thing that, that Latour talks about is that the classical science 
uh, in kind of objectifying, dis distancing uh, the world, kind of deanimated the world. The world became this kind of inert thing um, that animate human subjects uh, worked on. Um, and what, um, if you like, the, the, the late modern physics did was to, was to kind of reanimate that, that world, to, to show how much of that world was 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 animate, uh, and what was really striking uh, when uh, listening to 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 Jean there is that sense of of the question of animacy of animation uh, of uh, engaging with this sort of uh, this 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 notion or or radical notions of of the, the animate, and I, and I wonder to some extent whether. Um, we need to, to rethink that when we talk about multiculturalism, it seems to me that you know multiculturalism, which we tend to define in explicitly human terms, um, but whether we need to think about the cultures of trees, the cultures of insects, the cultures of rivers, the cultures of streams. So in other words, not just to simply think about it in terms of, 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 of languages, but the kinds of cultures that these languages are, are in, embedded in. So, so um, uh, in this uh, book that I've um, been, been working on, in recent times on, on, on travel writing and engagement with, with the environment. Um, one of the things I've been looking at is to see uh, travel writers uh, as in, engaged in multicultural negotiations, but, but parts of those cultures are the trees, the rivers, uh, the streams, the insects. And this, this goes back uh, to, the, uh, to the, the 16th century, the, the ways in which uh, explorers and travelers uh, engage with the, the animate and animated agency of, of the worlds that they entered uh, uh, into. So to, 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 to kind of rethink the, uh, the, the, the multicultural. Um, I mean, what Federico's uh, argument um, about you know, the need to um, bring indigenous cultures and to, to engage with them, to, to, as he said, to decolonize the curriculum, to decolonize uh, methodology. Um, it seems to me that this, that, that the connection between that and, and the notion of translating outdoors, I mean, what, I, what I'm suggesting yesterday about this um, drawing the work uh, of uh, Jan Blumat on, on linguistic superdiversity, that our cities, there was a, a, a body of thought in the 1960s who thought that our cities would become more and more monolingual, they'd become more and more homogenous, more and more multi um, monocultural. What happened, in fact, has been the exact opposite. Our cities have become more and more uh, linguistically plural, more and more, uh, this, more, and more kind of linguistic super diversity. Um, but the extraordinary thing is um, that this has not been reflected uh, in our uh, educational and pedagogical uh, and institutional practices. Uh, on the contrary, um, you know, many of the world's major languages have become minoritized uh, in, in particular kinds of, of practices. So I, I think that that point of view is, 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 is rather an, an, an important. I, I think the um, notion um, when um, a Charles uh, a Carlin was talking about the, the kind of hermeneutic, the sort of the, the transformative uh, energy uh, of, of, of the translational. Um, it reminded me a little bit of um, what happens in, you know, uh, when I'm teaching translation uh, in, 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 in Dublin. Um, you know, translation pedagogy is, is at, can at some level um, be the most uh, unrewarding experience on the planet and also the most rewarding. Uh, when it's unrewarding is when uh, students will expect you to have some kind of fair copy, which will be kind of whisked out of uh, the bag at the end of, uh, and now you'll show us how to, to properly translate as if there's a, a kind of a recipe there. Right? But I think that that kind of notion, that kind of assumption is a very deep one. Um, and it's you know, what Timothy Ingo says, the kind of the hylomorphic thinking, the, the notion um, that um, what you have is sort of a, a blueprint. Um, so we've got the architect's plans to, to build a cathedral. Uh, we've got the, the blueprint. Uh, to construct the, the, the machine and that you know it's basically once you have the blueprint then the rest is just the business of mechanical replication and, and operation what happens of course in uh translation and this is where i think carlin is, is you know in looking at plasticity and, and the hermeneutic is so important is that it's rather like those programs um come down with me uh, where you go expecting the perfect meal, but as the French and, and their kind of version of this program, they call it un dîner presque parfait, an almost perfect meal. And of course, what's great about it, the real fun begins when the meal goes wrong. Uh, when the thing is disaster, when you produce uh, this place and goes, wah, and then the, the people around the table think, 
oh my God, poor Duncan, he did his best, but really it's, it's not, you know. Um, so, and I, and I think that translation, it's, it's that, that hermeneutic possibility uh, of subverting the kind of the instrumentalist dictate of, of, of the blueprint that, that really makes uh, for the, the, the magic and, and, and the wonder uh, of uh, translation uh, itself. And Charles, um, uh, I did coin that term, my perspective, <laughs> and I coined it with great trepidation. I remember uh, when I came up with it, um, uh, googling uh, the term uh, on the uh, the internet, and um, I was so delighted when um, it. Uh, I, I use a, a, an Irish language version of Google, um, so it, it came up with this message uh, near Amshir Ein Tara Fin Shin. We didn't locate uh, any results uh, under that keyword. I think yes. <laughs> now, now I can uh, now I, I can use it. Um, but it did occur to me that um, one of the, the Charles was, was was talking about uh, micro travel, and I'm thinking about kind of you know uh, from you know, micro trips to micro chips. Uh, and the the notion of virtual travel, um, like in this book that I've been working on on on, on eco travel, um, one of the things that I was looking at was the um, the last section of the book is called uh, the end of travel, um, and uh, one of the things that I was looking at in, in the context of flight shaming and um, carbon emissions and so on, is um, you know the, the potential of, of virtual travel. You know where you where you, you you put on particular headsets and you can do this kind of virtual three D uh, exploration of spaces and and and, and so on. Uh, and is this you know? So I was kind of trying to situate this in vertical travel. Is this a form of vertical travel or something something different, something something else? But one of the things that did strike me about it, and it's been been signaled by some other um, scholars who've kind of worked on this, is as kind of algorithmic coercion, you know, that, that the kind of the virtual 3D tour uh, is heavily scripted by the engineers that kind of put this thing together in terms of what your potentiality is. And one of the things that you, that you, you, you can't is, is what I would call phenomenological spillage. So what I mean by that is the way in which um, you go to uh, visit a famous uh, gallery um, or cathedral or whatever, um, and you wander off on your own, um, and you become absorbed uh, by the fittings in the toilets, um, or you become so absolutely engrossed by, by looking up at a feature of, of the scene, which is not part of the guided tour, it's not part of the, you know, but, but you moving physically in this kind of three-dimensional space have this ability to, and I think this addresses um, some of the, 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 I think the challenge um, that, Susan was talking about with respect to, to Zoom, uh, and I'm just waiting for this new word to appear in German, uh, Auf Wiedersehen, you know, which would be a great way to kind of end the conference, but Auf Wiedersehen, or Sehen, but Auf Wiedersehen, um, is um, the, what, what I would call the necessity for phenomenological rebellion. Uh, the, the necessity, again, this is in, in, in by this notion of, of translating outdoors, the thing that Gene that, that was picking up on there is the, 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 the need to embrace um, our you know, three uh, dimensional multi sensory inhabitation of, 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 of the world. Um, because it seems to me that when we're talking about translation, we've got to think about translating in all of these, these challenges. And one of the things that, that, that strikes me, I'm just reading. Um, the finalists for the um, the uh, International Booker Prize at, at present, uh, and reading all of these writers um, from you know Maria Stepanova to David Jupp is, is how each one of these writers um, is obsessed with the question of multi uh, sensorality. Is is you know uh, how to 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 cope with and that notion uh, of translating these uh, different uh, senses. Uh, and um, this is, is where I, you know, I, I, I think this question uh, of, uh, of, 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 of borders uh, and the, um, what is the nature of, of these, these, these borders or uh, Victor Segalen, who's uh, quoted by Charles earlier, um, he said um, that the, 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 the nearest or the closest I get to understanding something is when I'm the furthest away from it. Um, in other words, it's that it's the the recognition of kind of an impossible distance 
becomes the greatest incentive of all to engage in the act of translation. Because I think that what, what really strikes me um, in, 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 in Rindon's um, uh, talk, um, in, 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 in Carlin's, in, 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 in Laura Danis, um, in Charles, in, in, it is the, the, the extent to which um, there is labor in, in translation, that some kind of notion of uh, fusional ecstatic uh, immediacy um, is something that is a, a kind of illusion. It's, it's a dangerous illusion because it props up the worst kinds of neo-colonial appropriation uh, of the worlds uh, around us. Um, and that in the notion of, of the kind of the labor of, of translation, I'm, I'm thinking of the, you know, Char Charles Darwin's last work was, was on earthworms. Now you might say if you're close to death, it's a pretty good topic uh, because it is something that's going to prey on you, you know, uh, because this is going to be your, your next likely encounter with another species. Um, but, um, but one of the points that, that Darwin makes, you know, is, you know, the, 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 the extraordinary necessary work that's done by, by earthworms in kind of churning up, transforming the soil, um, this kind of in, invisible uh, labor uh, force. Uh, and of course, you know, in, in a, a lot of kind of Marxist and post-Marxist theory will think about the invisibility of, of labor as, as making societies and things. And I think that that's one of the things that the eco uh, translational paradigm can help us to draw attention to is uh, the necessity uh, of of looking and investigating um, that 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 labor um, and the the the, um, the extent to which that that labor is uh, both necessary and, and and vital and this of course is where um, the humanities and social sciences are absolutely central to any notion of a viable future. Uh, without it, uh, we're, we're we're condemned to um, a geo uh, engineered uh, kinetic inferno. So, um, so, thank you, Michael. Thank, thank you so much. Um, perhaps uh, we can at this point then uh, take a few more questions from uh, from the uh, the audience. Um, just to say, you, you were spot on with my culinary skills. By the way, I don't think uh, I don't think they would impress. <laughs> <That'd be impressive>. <laughs> But uh, 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 unwittingly, you uh, perhaps put your, your, your finger on something there. Um, we, we've had uh, a, a couple of uh, uh, observations come through. Um, uh, question from, uh, from Zulka Luhmann. This has been really fascinating. Thank you all so much. My question is the old boring and predictable but unavoidable one about the relevance of theory to practice, about how to translate reflection and knowledge into practice, as it were. How can I adapt my translatorial uh, practice to my newly heightened understanding of the more than human, let alone my heightened awareness of impending ecological catastrophe. And then in parentheses, if keep calm and carry on is no longer an option, uh, what are we doing calmly discussing these questions? But uh, I don't know uh, if uh, I can see a number of uh, our other speakers are also present here for the uh, round table. Um, so a, a, a general question from uh, Zilka about uh, translating uh, our reflection and knowledge into practice, specifically in relation to the, the more than human. And uh, if, uh, please just uh, unmute and, uh, and, and do come in if you uh, would like to contribute. I, I can begin to to, to answer the question, and hopefully, I, I'm delighted for the colleagues would would, would come in. Um, I mean, th there's so many different dimensions to that question, but let, let me take 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 one, which is the the immediately uh, practical one. Um, I, I did an, an, an article recently for the uh, the linguist, which is the. the journal that's uh, read by um, so many kind of practicing. Uh, translators in 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 Britain, and uh, that was one of the things I was asked. Well, you know, in, in practical terms, what what does this 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 mean? Um, and just to, to, to take out one particular strand from that, um, and I think maybe we, we might not have said enough about this, um, but is that the. Uh, the virtual is never simply virtual. It's it's material. Um, that one of the things that we have to to, to think about, for example, uh, when we work as as translators, 
um, is what kind of equipment are we using? Uh, what kind of energy uh, supplier uh, are we using? Um, what kind uh, of uh, uh, ethical uh, practices um, are, are used by the companies um, that, they, that we, we work for? Um, to what extent, um, so uh, in, in terms of the localization industry, um, whose growth is predicated on uh, a model of infinite growth uh, of, of goods and services. Um, to what extent is it um, right or ethical or, or proper um, to, to continue working or to be, to be part of that um, industry? Now, the immediate response to that is, well, I don't really have a choice in the matter. I've got to, 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 to make uh, a living uh, out of this. Um, but this is uh, precisely the kind of ethical uh, dilemma that's faced by people right across um, the uh, spectrum in, in different areas of uh, employment, because not just translators that work for uh, the localization uh, industry. Um, and the, 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 the response um, you, you can see in different uh, areas, for example, you see this um, in the uh, software engineering uh, area, is that there's beginning to be a movement there, uh, which is saying um, that uh, computing power is a, uh, a good, is, is, is a scarce uh, good, um, and that it's a good that's got to be uh, redeployed for public good rather than private, uh, private profit. Uh, one could equally argue that translation is a, a scarce resource uh, on our planet. Um, there's simply far more things that need to be translated than there are uh, translators. Um, so we've got to think uh, to what extent should that translation uh, resource then um, be uh, repurposed uh, for public goods, health, education, and so on, uh, rather than uh, private, uh, private profit. Uh, and that, of course, that means creating the conditions uh, for that. Um, but there are, there are, there are simple, you know, in terms of the computers you use, uh, the phones you use, um, the, the energy uh, supplier uh, that you have, um, these are choices that can be um, that, that 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 can be made, and and they're small. Uh, one of the, the curious things, or the, the difficult things about the climate change, is a scalar discrepancy. Uh, in other words, we have this huge hyper object, which is climate change, which is extended in time and space, um, and it's in, it's it's overwhelming uh, for us. Um, but yet, our response to it has to be on kind of these kind of micro scale. Uh, scale, and sometimes it can be difficult to connect one scale uh, to the to the other. Thank you, Michael. Um, Carolyn, please do come in. Yeah, thank you so much, and and thank you, Silka, for coming, bringing us back to that question, which I think is really at the heart of translation studies, and which is why translation studies is so compelling between uh, theory and practice, and. I think that what I will take from our, our conversation over the last two days is maybe those last words from Michael about labor. And I had never put labor as the piece between uh, theory and practice, um, but I think it, it, help, it really helps to do that. And it helps me with another question that I have um, and that maybe Rindon, um, uh, because I so enjoyed the way that you were talking about uh, introducing biology and uh, fluidity, uh, that was really fantastic. Uh, to hear your presentation and to have your perspective as well. Um, but the, the, the question, uh, we love relationality. And as a result, we are constantly being drawn, I feel, into metaphors. And at the same time, uh, I think maybe a counterpoint to metaphor is labor, the real um, working of the material. And so um, I was trying to think, because what I'm always troubled with when I'm trying to think through uh, these ways of thinking about translation is, am I just talking in metaphors? Because that's not enough. I want to talk about what it really is. Um, and I know uh, Catherine Malibu in um, uh, Epigenesis of, uh, of Reason, her, she gets to a certain point in her whole argument where she says, if all I'm talking about is analogy, then I've completely failed. And I, I, I haven't really offered anything here. Um, so I, I'm trying to think through, uh, I know that there's a whole field and a whole uh, many, many works around uh, the relationship between translation and metaphor, but I think ego translation forces us to really um, bring that to the fore, uh, because eco translation is first and foremost a practical call to action, uh, and in that sense, um, metaphor 
uh, might help us act, but it's not really going to help us diagnose exactly what's going on or what we're doing. So I'm, I'm putting some threads together that I was trying to um, uh, think through in, re in response to all of this. And I just want to say also to Laura Dana, thank you so much. Since yesterday, I've been thinking about uh, Filomena Coppola's fantastic installation. <laughs> Uh, it was really so powerful and I, I've been talking and describing it to people that there's something again about the material that that question of those footsteps messing up that beautiful carpet uh, and that illusion of the carpet that then becomes the earth and all of the relationships maybe to the land that Jean's talking about. Mm -hmm. um, but so I think uh, trying to maybe think what eco translation brings to translation um, uh, that these pieces for me have been really helpful uh, over the last two days. Can I jump into that, Duncan, just to say, um, a, a yes, you know, and I will pass that on to, to Filomena. I owe her a, a, an email, which I have been putting off because I've been impossibly snowed under things. But she, you know, um, she's a, an incredible artist and her work in general is, is phenomenal. But to me, precisely that sense of, um, also, you know, it, it, it's, it's something else that that's come, that come through so strongly in it over the past few days. The sense of, on the one hand, not wanting to end up in dichotomies and, and you know, I think Susan's notion today of, of, of randomness, but also of our, of our pining for the unexpected, for the unplanned, for the informal, especially at, at, at present, is very important there. But at the same time, it's also this constant reminder that, yes, that it's not a question of, 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 of sitting back and, and pretending nothing is happening. We have agency. We have to find those elements of agency. And we have to find those elements of agency in that recognition of the materiality of our practices, of the, of the, um, of, of the labor precisely that goes into that, and also the impact of all of our practices. And paradoxically, you know, I, I have a note here of all the things that the last two days have been incredible. They, they, they've taken me in so many different directions, with just the random connections I have been making and the ones that people have been giving. But funnily enough, I've been trying to connect some of the things that Michael was saying yesterday about that double sense of culture as well, you know, culture and, 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 and cultivation, culture and agriculture. But for me, that doesn't stop with the metaphorical. I share Rinder, when Rinder at the end was saying, you know, I'm still struggling. Do I even want to talk about metaphor? And I share that, that struggle because I also find, and this is true in the field of language and multilingualism, for instance, there's naturalization, natural, naturalizing metaphors. You know, the metaphors to do with native speakers and with mother tongue and so on that biologize our relationship with language and somehow reify it and make that exclusivity so powerful. I, I sometimes really struggle against them. I have stopped using those words, mother tongue, native speaker, for that reason, for instance. So they're so powerful, but they're also so um, enticing, these metaphors. And so the constant reminder that what we're dealing with is practices. Michael's words now about the importance of our pedagogical practice, for instance, I think that is fundamental. It has to be inscribed into what I keep thinking of also that fight against perfect translation. There was, again, there was in the chat a reminder of um, the, the wonderful um, essay by the wonderful piece by Kate Briggs when she talks about translation as, as inscribing, you know, the risk of failure all the time. And that's what makes it interesting. I always also think about Judith Butler's discussion on the promise. When I say I promise is because I can't, it's not just a statement of fact. The promise implies the possibility of failure. And I've come to think of translation as an ethical commitment, which is precisely about that. It's about the promise. I promise to do the best, the, the most ethical, the most um, inclusive as well uh, job as I can as a translator or as a teacher of translation, as a trainer of translators. But that implies that possibility of failure and that has to remain there. Um, and I'll close by saying that paradoxically that notion of practice then takes me to the opposite uh, um, end because I was also thinking about, you know, Jean's fantastic talk now and that idea, you know, what I had in my mind is, is the idea of genius loci, but also and the relationship with, with nature. And then that took me back 
to the question that was that was being asked of of, um, of us, you know, about the indoor and the outdoor. And, and I've had, you know, cardinals outside. And yesterday when we finished, I, I went for a walk and there were a horseshoe crab on, on, on the, the beach here, which, which are amongst the most arcane, archaic, archaeological beings on the planet at present. And that made me think, you know, my own reaction to the confinement last summer was that I ended up as an atheist translating Gerald Manley Hopkins and discussing St. Francis' relationship with nature with colleagues who are equally non-religious like me. But it's that attempt to somehow find those multiple connections that I think is animating us. And as translators and translation scholars, that's the big question that is there all the time. But it's not abstract, it's not metaphorical, it's, it's as real as it gets. Thank you, Loredana. Um, Jean had to, uh, had to disconnect. Um, and I should say as well that uh, uh, Federico uh, sent his uh, apologies and is, is not able to join us for uh, the round table. Um, Rindon, I'm, I'm very aware that you've stayed with us uh, into quite late into the, in, into the night where you are, I think. Uh, and I wondered if, if you wanted to come back on uh, a, a number of uh, the uh, other uh, panelists have referred back to your, uh, your presentation. First of all, I'm immensely grateful for, to all the panel members for reflecting on my paper. Uh, one thing I was thinking about looking at this particular question, how we can connect theory with practice. And I think, you know, uh, the, the paper that, you know, Cronin presented yesterday, he was talking about a project where he can bring in all the, you know, uh, the expertise and then go to a particular place, we'll work on their I think that is something we can do. The eco translation, one of the major possibilities to work on the field is how we can use eco translation in helping the marginal communities. And I am actually working on Cronin's idea of, you know, on, on this particular topic. And I'm trying, there is a, a local place here, there is a, an artisan village. Uh, it's about you know uh, a jewelry uh, thing uh, artisans, and I'm I'm thinking of how I can use you know Cronin's idea uh, in practical sense and uh, and and do something that can help uh, you know to achieve academic social responsibility. Uh, we have a, a further a question from uh, Fulia Mamara who says, thank you very much for these inspiring talks. My question is, when we think of the general frame of the point of views shared by uh, the uh, precious professors and researchers, we see that we all appreciate the variety and try to minimize the other in our minds. Still, the way we think stays pretty human centered. In this regard, do you think that uh, translation can or should take a sincerely radical position in terms of non-human animals? So are we still too human? Yeah. Well, no, I know. Th I, I think obviously that that is the the, the great uh, preoccupation. I think Jean articulated that so well in her presentation. I mean, the the, the, the consciousness, the the awareness uh, of the, the the dangers of 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 anthropomorphism. You know, and uh, in that the the eco translation book. I mean, I was I was looking at uh, Werner Herzog's film Grizzly, uh, where Timothy Treadwell. Um, uh, goes uh, off to to Alaska and befriends uh, grizzly uh, bears and sets up you know this this group called Grizzly People and gives talks about them and so on um, and you know uh, 2003 you know he and his Danish uh, partner uh, are um, are killed uh, by one of the uh, of the bears but but what the kind of the wardens say in in the um, and in one of the parks that 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 he he went to was that he he, he failed to realize uh, the nature of otherness. He failed to to to, to recognize that you know he he was anthropomorphizing the. Um, so I, I think that that's something that um, as as humans um, we have to be uh, obviously extremely conscious of, and because that's precisely the translator's dilemma. The translator's dilemma is. When I am translating a text from, you know, uh, language A into language B, you know, I'm a speaker of language. To what extent am I 
you know, constantly domesticating what's 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 coming in from that that that, that language. Except, of course, now we're moving from intraspecies to inter uh, species, uh, and this is where I think that the um, the thinking that's been done by social anthropologists like Timothy Ingold, um, ethnobiologists like Catherine Johnson, her, her you know that slide I put up yesterday about responsible anthropomorphism, um, it's it's not a question. Uh, it seems to me of you know projection of kind of you know uh, projection you, you, human notion. It's 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 negotiating or thinking about um, how worlds emerge in that in between uh, space um, between uh, humans uh, and uh, animals. Because the thing is that I mean it's 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 rather like the 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 question that was asked earlier today about you know the the transplanting of the tr the, the tree as agency. And when the tree enters into another place, when gray squirrels uh, arrived in, 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 in Ireland, um, they radically altered um, the existing sets of, of, of relationship with, with, with the, you know, what was called the native squirrel, the red uh, squirrel. Um, and this then uh, produced a kind of a, a ripple effect in terms of, of human communities and, and particular lands that could be occupied and so on. So, uh, so I, I think that the, the, the notion of, uh, emergent uh, agency and these in between. This is a, it's a more useful way to think about the translation relationship uh, in interspecies sense, r rather than the notion, the, the the kind of the older notions of of human centered uh, projections. Uh, let's uh, move to a, a question from uh, Ye Tian. For translation to make the magic work, to subvert or to make a change at least, the issue of trust emerges as well which is already an important aspect in, for example, crisis translation. How do we pin down the role of trust in, in research on eco-translation? Well, I, I, maybe just one observation is that, that um, okay, there's been a lot of work recently on trust, but again, uh, the, re the recent work on trust in translation, I'm thinking of um, you know, a project by Andrea Arizzi and others, and it's been mostly actually, on the, again, on the, on the human level. I, I think, and, and on the history of kind of, you know, also the profession of translator and how trust comes into that and, and so on. I think the shift that, that Michael is, is pointing towards um, has to be a shift on that, that ethical ground. And, and it, it's something that Michael said yesterday when, when in his talk was about, you know, we may not have the answer, but we are engaging. The point is that there has to be an engagement Trust has to, um, you know, trust has to be built on that notion of engagement, not on some kind of uh, perfection or perfectibility of translation. I, 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 I keep, you know, that that's um, maybe something that I was trying to say yesterday, but I didn't say explicitly. That, for instance, for me, that notion of translation as not being a form of substitution, not being a form of erasure but being a form of co-presence means that you have to ditch that idea of a perfect translation, as I was saying with Ricoeur, you know, when he says ditch the idea of perfect language, ditch the idea of perfect translatability, just ditch the idea of perfection, I think. Um, and then you can build relationships of trust that are more ethical and that have to be reciprocal. Now, I don't know, again, we, we're back in, in that position. We don't know how to establish that form, that communication, or that kind of link when we go to the more than human. But to be perfectly honest, we don't know it even with the human. The question of marginality, marginalization, the question of inclusivity, the question of the relationship between language and social justice. I was interviewing two weeks ago Suresh Kanagaraja, who'd just given a talk to us on precisely what Mike mentioned a minute ago, which is the idea of a darker side of mobility. That's exactly what his title was, the dark side of mobility. And now we, you know, we need to, again, think of mobility from positions of privilege, positions of, of minoritization, position of marginalization, and so on. So I, I think the only way to build relationships of trust is on that kind of recognition. But I don't think that we have the answer. Um, but again, not having the answer is a, is a good position in a way. I, I, th I think probably just to, to join in there with what Loredana said, I, I think one of the reasons that trust has become problematic is that um, I think translation has 
you know, has historically been part of very violent practices. So I was thinking about the, the, the word that, that Rindon was using earlier about transplant, and I was thinking of transplantation, uh, and I was thinking of the way in which, you know, um, translation was used in, in these highly instrumental ways um, to convert uh, populations of people to, to different uh, religions to, you know, when I was working this travel book, you know, I, I was rereading Walter Raleigh's The Discovery of, of Guyana, uh, where, you know, uh, when he's um, on the island, uh, it's Trinidad, where he's, um, he's, he's, he's using translators quite extensively, um, and he's very dependent on them, but of course, the, the way in which you use it is to extract it, the information to, to then set about a whole set of extractivist uh, practices. So I think it, it seems to me um, that there's been a terrible breach of trust um, that has led to so much suffering um, for subjects and indigenous peoples around the planet through particular kinds uh, of uh, instrumentalist translation practices. And I think it's, it's precisely the, the, the kind of the use of restorative hermeneutic practices of translation uh, through various forms of poetic or literary translation where you're you're restoring the kind of the uh, eco-cultural eco-linguistic uh, complexity uh, of those cultures and th this is the kind of the, the reparative uh, work that 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 the Carl was, was was talking about that is so important but um but there is i, I I'm, there, there is that historical debt there that that historical memory which is not a good one um Perhaps we can just take one one further question then, um, which is I think Michael directed uh, 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 at you uh, and a comment you made earlier from Fiona Kelso. Can you give us an example of the kind of surveillance in the translation industry that you you, you mentioned? Well, um, one of the things that um, is very uh, apparent, I mean, and, and Susan alludes to this question of, 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 of migration uh, earlier is um, that basically, you know, every agent of the state um, with a portable computer uh, is a border guard, um, is, is a frontier uh, post. Um, and in, in order for that to be uh, operational or functional um, in a multilingual world, um, what you have increasingly built into it are, are, are translation functions. I mean, uh, you know, some of the, the, the biggest and most important uh, investors in machine translation are the military. Um, military, uh, you know, armies uh, all over the world are, are investing very heavily uh, in machine translation. They're investing in machine intelligence. Um, and uh, as our police forces. And so, I mean, <laughs> there's, I mean, there's a book that came out there uh, a while back called The Dark Side of, 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 of Translation. Um, and this, this, this is part of it. I mean, I, I think to some extent, we can have excessively angelic or irenic notions <laughs> of translation. Again, goes back to this kind of pontifical uh, image that I was talking about yesterday. It's kind of, kind of great this bridge builders or this wonderful button badge. I remember seeing at a translators conference in 1988 in Maastricht that the, the FIT conference was translators mean well. Mm -hmm. um, they, they may mean well, but that doesn't necessarily mean um, that uh, what they do will be purposed to uh, good or emancipatory uh, ends and you know, can become you know, a very deep part of, of a kind of regulatory <laughs> uh, surveillance culture. <clears throat> Thank you, Michael. I think we, we should uh, begin to draw to a close at this point. Um...